Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Spin It Social Hour. My name is Stefan Kaplan, and it is an absolute pleasure to be here with everyone today. This is the 22nd show of the Spin It Social Hour, and the Spin It Social Hour is a labor of love born out of care and concern for our photo community. When this pandemic hit, I decided as a social media and visual strategist that I was going to reach out and try to help the photo community to get their names out there more, to get their work out there more, so that as this pandemic uh, continues and hopefully subsides one day, that they are able to get more work and also be better known because there is so much going on out there in the world right now that a lot of things are getting lost in the mix and we don't want that to happen with our photographers. So once again, my name is Stefan Kaplan, welcome. I have worked with the likes of the Pulitzer Prizes, AARP, the Jackson Charitable Foundation, and I also work with my dear colleague Sri Srinivasan and his Digi Mentors group doing tons of live stream productions and many other social media needs that we meet. So today our guest is Tom Franklin, and we're going to bring him on very soon. But as a show, we must try to get sponsors these days and everything else. So I am pleased. I am really thrilled to announce my first sponsor, which is Real Talk Live from the Barn with my friend Emilio Pardo, who is now I am producing the show with him. And it is how to deal with the onslaught of stress next week. We will be talking with Janet Taylor, who's a psychiatrist who has been on Good Morning America and many other shows. And it's a show that will deal with real talk about COVID-19, economic uncertainty, racial injustice, and many other topics. So on that note, Real Talk, live from the barn. Join us next week at 11 a.m. on Sunday, September 6th. So, but today we are here to talk about photography and social media with Tom Franklin. So let me give him the buildup that he deserves as the great photographer that he is. Thomas E. Franklin is an award-winning photographer, multimedia journalist, documentary filmmaker, and educator. He is perhaps best known for his iconic flag-raising photograph taken at Ground Zero on 9-11, which was depicted on a U.S. postage stamp and has helped raise over $10 million for victims of the terrorist attacks and for which he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. He has also produced highly acclaimed multimedia projects on topics such as a recent heroin epidemic and toxic dumping by the Ford Motor Company on Native American land in North Jersey. He joined Montclair State University in 2015 as a professor in multimedia journalism. After nearly 30 years in the news industry, he is currently working on a series of ongoing projects related to immigration and migration. We are currently living in one of the largest mass migrations of refugees in world history. Prior to COVID-19, the story was getting headlines and now you don't hear about it much anymore. And Tom Franklin is now here to talk about it with us and his whole body of work. Tom, welcome. Hey, Stefan, thanks for having me. Welcome to the Spin of Social Hour, and thank you for being here. It's an honor to have you on. Um, I can't believe that we've lived in Ramsey together uh, since I've been up here, probably, and we met like six months ago uh, through Carla Baranakis, uh, a colleague of yours and an ex-colleague of mine and at the New York Times, and wow, it's just great to have you here, man. Yeah, it's good to meet you, and uh, I thank Carla for making that uh, connection for us. She's amazing, she's a great woman, and uh, so you know, it's great that you two get to work together at Montclair State, and um, this is gonna be a great show. Uh, I've prepared a lot for you, and we're gonna have two live viewers that are gonna come on and ask a couple of questions. 
But, you know, first, let's let's get into the uh, story about Tom Franklin. And let me um, get right here. Sorry. It's, uh... So what I wanted to ask you, Tom, was how did you get started in photography? And what was the experience that changed the way you viewed photography? And tell us tell us the story, Tom. Uh, so I was a, you know, I was a really creative kid growing up. I was uh, very artistic. Uh, I was voted most artistic in high school. And um, uh, I, I had this creative side to me. And then I took a, and you know, my mom always encouraged me to be creative. And uh, when I was in college, I discovered photography and I took a photojournalism class. Uh, and when I was in college at SUNY Purchase, I got a job working in the dark room at the Journal News newspaper, which is a fairly large suburban paper. Mm -hmm. And I was printing pictures that went in the paper the next day, and I was hooked. I, um, I wanted to be like the photojournalists whose photographs I was developing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was, uh, there was something about photography that spoke to me. And uh, I don't, I think, it, I think it has a lot to do with the, the immediacy of photography. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not really have the patience for drawing and sculpture and painting. Uh, photography was immediate. Plus, I'm a curious person by nature, and I like interacting with people. So photojournalism provided this great opportunity for me to go out and make pictures, stay creative, make stuff and also report. And also, you know, it, it, it got me a front row seat to a lot of really uh, important events. I was always interested in sports. I played sports and to be able to cover sports as a photojournalist was a lot of fun earlier in my career. Uh, as you quickly learn, it's a, it's not as easy as it looks and it's very uh, uh, demanding. And uh, But I went through a phase where I covered lots of professional sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah we did. Yeah. Uh, we showed a few of those in the intro slideshow mm -hmm. that I built for you. And, uh, you know, I mean, that photo you took of Derek Jeter, man. I mean, wow. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I love covering sports. It's it's hard, and especially when you do it on a regular basis. And I have uh, great respect for you know a lot of my colleagues who do that on a regular basis. Right, right. Um, no, it's sports photography. I've always said is you you know the sports photographers are in a league of their own uh, because it takes a whole different set of skills. You know, it's a whole different set of skills from walking the streets and doing photojournalism and other things. But you you know the one thing I love about you is that you you've done so much and now doing your thing of it, being a professor at Montclair State and giving back and you know I've heard a lot about you you're a very giving professor a very giving person in uh, in nature and you know isn't it the best to be able to now teach <laughs> I, I love teaching I um, you know I had a long career in in newspapers and I worked for the Bergen record for 20 something years and right. I had 30 years of being on the street and you know and and I really liked that. But, um, you know, I had, uh, you know, even going back to like the mid 2000s, I started to see how the industry was changing, how storytelling was changing. Mm -hmm. I pretty much taught myself how to produce video and create multimedia. Mm -hmm. And the last 15 years of my career, I have, you know, been a cross platform you know, journalist. I do my own writing. I shoot and edit my own videos. I work as a one one man band. And uh, but all throughout my years of working at the record, uh, I also taught. I taught at Ramapo College for 12 years as an adjunct. Right. Um, and then when this opportunity at Montclair State presented itself in 2015, uh, I, you know, I jumped at it and I love being at Montclair. I, I love the students that we have there. Yeah. Uh, I love being able to share what I've learned through my career with other people. I get great satisfaction yeah. out of seeing young people you know, uh, get excited about storytelling and I can't get enough of that when they're excited. And I so I try to share that passion with them. I know. I just recently started my first time teaching at FIT this past semester and it was a thrill. And of course, wow, what an experience being thrown into teaching. And then right away out of the blue, the pandemic hits and then we're all virtual. So, wow, that was quite the experience. But Montclair is a great campus. I love walking around there. And um, uh, a neighbor of ours here, Karen Barrett, is actually the captain of the Montclair uh, State Police on campus there. So, nice. yeah, nice. son and uh, my our son goes to school together. Anyway, um, so that's that's uh, mm. you know the beginning of your story. You know, um, 
So let me bring up, let me bring up because I have so much to show here with you. You have quite the body of work, Tom, I have to tell you. And it's, it's amazing. Um, I have to, sorry, I had this slideshow. Rule number one, I have the slideshow at the very beginning here. <laughs> so let me uh, set here. And so many people know, uh, and many don't, uh, and we're going to enlighten them today about your iconic photo at Ground Zero on September 11th of the firefighters raising the flag. It's a tough, with September 11th coming up, it's always a tough time of the year for so many people. Our hearts go out to everybody who ever lost somebody there and everybody who's uh, lived through this all. But tell us about, uh, briefly about, not briefly, but tell us about some of that day, Tom, and how how it played out for you. That's the only way I can put it. Sure, so um, on, on the morning of September 11th, I happened to be in the office at the, at the Bergen Record uh, for a meeting. I had just gotten back from the Dominican Republic a day or two before uh, working on a story related to baseball. And uh, it was unusual that I was in the office that early and uh, uh, an editor came running into the photo department saying a plane hit the World Trade Center. Uh, I was on the fourth floor uh, of a building in Hackensack and I ran out to the window and I could see the North Tower from there. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately knew instinctively that that was not an accident, that this was uh, significant. Grabbed my gear, ran to my car, started to drive to Manhattan. Uh, when the second plane hit, uh, I diverted uh, down to Jersey City Exchange Place and I made pictures there all, uh, most of the morning um, of a very chaotic dramatic scene there of, of rescue boats uh, bringing people to Jersey City where they had a triage center set up with this uh, just surrealistic uh, scene of smoke billowing from the towers in the background. Um, uh, that photograph right there on the right was taken in Jersey City and that's a fireman being rescued. And it was, uh, it was incredible. And um, uh, it was uh, difficult to make pictures there because the police were trying to get everybody away from there and uh, almost got arrested a couple of times there it was um, I had a cam I was carrying two digital SLR cameras uh, that with me. Uh, I got pushed by a police officer. The camera banged into the pole and didn't wor stopped working. Um, and so it was a really, you know, for, for the obvious reasons, but also for what had happened, you know, with my camera, it was kind of a stressful scene. Sure. And then, um, and then around one o'clock, uh, I and another photographer, we talked our way onto a boat mm -hmm. and we got to ground zero early in the afternoon. Um, and uh, you had that picture of me uh, wearing the mask um, near ground zero. And that's an important photograph because uh, that's the only picture made of me that day. Uh, and it was taken by his photographer, John Wheeler, the guy who helped, who, who we talked, he, he and I talked our way onto that boat. Right. And what's ironic, significant about this photograph is this was made shortly after we got there. Uh, and after this picture was taken, I moved all around the, 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 the wreckage there making photographs. Mm -hmm. And about uh, three hours later, it was in virtually that same exact spot that the flag racing picture was made. Um, and you could see just over my shoulder there, there's a little rise uh, in the shadow there. And that's where the flag raising act, act took place. Right. And I shot that photograph somewhere closer to that red vehicle there with a longer lens. And so um, that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's an important photograph and uh, it kind of sure. you know, really you know, it takes my breath away to, to, go, to go back. Yeah. You know, all these years later to that moment in time in history. I know, you know, there's there's always that moment where we all have to take a breath. I mean, I, I was actually, I had just moved to Jersey City and I was living right across the river, right by Newport Plaza there. Mm -hmm. And I uh, photographed it from the Jersey side and um, I, I don't show my work when I show my photographer's work, but uh, there's a double spread photo of the silhouette of Manhattan after the both towers came down that I took in the 9-11 book for the New York Times. But my point is that that morning I was standing there with a gentleman who didn't know if his friends, if his family ever got out of the World Trade Center and we grabbed each other and we hugged and we cried and then I started photographing because there was so much. I mean, you just, I mean, how all of us controlled any emotions that day. It was, it was unbelievable, the bodies of work, uh, God, uh, the, the amount of work that was done that day, 
uh, by photographers, but what an effort, a Herculean effort by photojournalists and, and even amateur photographers that day. Yeah, well, um, two things about that. One, uh, it was the hardest day that I've ever encountered as a photographer. And uh, I definitely broke down a couple of times that day. It was extremely difficult to compartmentalize your emotions right. and perform your job. It, it was very apparent to me that what we were doing as photojournalists that day was really important. And documenting that day was, well, that's what I do for a living, but that was the, the job that day. Right. But I also knew at the same time that, you know, my older brother worked in, in near the World Trade Center, had usually commuted through that building in the morning, and I was concerned about his whereabouts. Mm -hmm. And I knew just like off the top of my head that there were dozens of people that I knew who worked in those buildings, you right. know, and I was concerned about my photojournalist friends as well. Right. Uh, David Hanchu comes to mind. And I distinctly remembered worrying about David because I knew what a news hound he was and yep. he didn't be there. Yep. And so when I was watching this all unfold from across the river, it was, uh, it, it had packed all the emotions that you would imagine or associate with it. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to say is that is that uh, for the 10th anniversary of 9-11, I produced a documentary film on the photographers of 9-11. I interviewed mm -hmm. A number of photographers, certainly not all the photographers that covered that and that day. Yeah, and that's all witness to history, right? Witness to history, yeah. And so I'm very proud of that documentary. It, it, yeah. it, it won a couple of uh, uh, video awards, um, but it really is a testament to the, the, the grit of some of the great photographers that day. Uh, Aris yeah. Economopoulos comes to mind and, uh, and many, many others. And may, um, I, may I show a small clip of that right now? Um, Absolutely. I'm going to show a small clip for everybody on the part uh, that incorporates Ricky Flores and you talking about the flag. Ricky and Laurie Grinker. There's yeah, so and many. Laurie Grinker and exactly. And Aristide, it's too long to show everything, but I will show a quick clip. So let's do that right now. I'm going to mute myself. <clears throat> The fundraising picture was made at 5 o'clock on September 11th. Trade Center Building Number 7 was going to fall, so the search and rescue effort at, at Ground Zero was, was halted. I'm exploring the room, but looking aside, and then you know, walking over to the tunnel, I see the firefighters climbing on, onto the trailer. And I saw these three firemen kind of on the southwest corner edge of, of where the rubble was from the World Trade Center. And I saw them fumbling with this flag. And just then, the flag went up. I began to photograph from there. I was myself, Lori Grinker was the other photographer. It went up very quickly. It went up without any sort of performance. And I shot a burst of pictures of the flag being raised with the World Trade Center rubble in the background. Pretty much at that point, I was on auto drive. I was shooting. You know, I knew I had to get a photograph. I began to shoot, 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 shoot. Uh, the three firemen did not know the picture was even being taken. Uh, there were no words exchanged between me and them. They raised the flag. I shot the picture, and it was over. It was over that quickly. I don't think that at the time, um, that image in itself was one of the most significant ones for me. It wasn't until the next morning when the phones were ringing off the hook that I started to get an idea that that it, this picture was getting a lot of attention. From the next moment forward, this picture has lived a life of its own. The, the level of interest in this picture um, it was just off the charts. It never felt like it was a bag racing to a victory. You know, it never felt like, it was like, you know, our brothers died here that day. We're gonna raise this flag in their honor. That, you know, that uh, the rest of the documentary that you did, I ask everybody to go to Tom's website. We've been showing it on the bottom here, thomasefranklin.com. Go to his video section, check out all of the incredible documentaries he's done, including Witness to History, uh, Witnesses to History. Uh, yeah. So I just want to point out, though, that, that that's a small excerpt from the film. The, the film's not about me. <laughs> it's, no, no, no. Uh, I'm part of the thing. But the first the first three minutes of that, that, that document are very powerful, where I use 
the tape recordings of the police dispatches. Right. Um, and I use that as the soundtrack to take the, us through the day. And, yeah. um, you know, the, 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 the testimony of some of the photographers, particularly in the first couple of minutes of that film is very powerful. Yes. If we, uh, if you want, I could show it now, if not, we could, uh, you know, it, yeah, the, the first couple of minutes, uh, you know, particularly, uh, you know, until, you know, to the part where Bob Cummins speaks, that's really powerful. Okay. Hold on one second. Let's show it. Your, your this is your show and this is your, you know, what let's, mm -hmm. let's do it. Um, I would just say while you're queuing that up, that it's okay. it's heavy. You know, it's very heavy to it'll transport you back to that day. Yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, just so you know, folks, um, if you um, we are going to show a couple of images from 9/11. Uh, if anybody feels that they will be disturbed by this because of the memories, please feel free to to tune out. We do not want to uh, do that to anybody. But this yeah. is. It's not graphic, but it's-, yeah, no, it's I know. I'm just letting people know that if they feel heavy about it, they should tune out uh, and that's that. So hold on one second. We just had a, a plane crash into Alpha 4 of the World Trade Center. It was the most widely observed event by media in history. Transmit a second alarm and start relocating companies into the area. Get a phone call at 8.55 from our photo editor, and she told me a plane was in the tower. And I knew that, that something really bad was going down. And it was one of our photo editors, and she said, uh, a plane's hit the World Trade Center, bag the fashion show, you have to go. I followed behind Rescue Company One, big red fire truck with their lights going, their sirens going. The World Trade said that tower number one is on fire. The whole outside of the building was just a huge explosion. There were firefighters arriving, uh, pulling hoses, going into the building, ambulances, police cars showing up. Send every available ambulance, everything you got to the World Trade Center now. The whole New York City skyline was engulfed with smoke. There was no doubt in my mind that those firefighters would climb into the building, rescue people, put out the fire. Uh, we have fire on several floors, the upper floors of the World Trade Center. Put the lens on the camera, filming the camera as I walked to the balcony. At that point, I saw a plane approaching lower Manhattan. I waited until the instant that plane got in front of the tower. I lifted the camera, deciding I'm going to take a picture of the plane juxtaposed against the city. It appears an airplane crashed into the World Trade Center. I went, holy shit. I said, that was the plane. I knew I saw it, I knew I witnessed it, but was I really seeing what I photographed? It was just staggering to me. I couldn't believe that I actually caught that plane. It's the first battalion transmitted that it looked like it was intentional and going into the box, it could be a terrorist just became amazingly obvious that this wasn't an accident. And I said, I have a picture. And a man says, oh my God, that's a commercial jetliner. And then another man walked up to me behind me and he said, my God, he said, you have the picture. Cool. Pretty heavy stuff. It's one of the yeah, nuclear attacks. Um, but you know what? Um, we lived through it, and um, many didn't. Um, sorry, I'm getting choked up, as we all do. Um, so, you know, um, wow, Tom. I mean, you know, that, that what you did there multimedia-wise uh, is award-winning work. Uh, really, really powerful. Uh, I think that's the power of multimedia, and hats off to you for putting together such an important and incredible mini-documentary. Thanks. I appreciate that. No, I listen, I'm glad you wanted to show it. I, I, you know, I had certain things selected, but I'm glad we went there and showed it. It's that powerful. So yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just say Steph, you know, this time of year for, 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 for us, you, me, you know, those of us who are New Yorkers, I'm, I'm a New York native New Yorker. This time of year is, uh, is really, really difficult. Yeah. And, no, um, and listen, my mom, you know, my mom's retired NYPD. I know a ton of cops, uh, Jimmy Leahy from the 6th Precinct, who I knew and worked with uh, around with the guys from the 6th Precinct, lost his life in 9-11. God bless Jimmy. 
God bless everybody who lost their lives that day, uh, public yeah. and civil service. But anyway, um, hey, hey, let me just say one thing. I saw one of the questions here was, you know, how yeah. does it feel to have taken an iconic picture or an iconic picture for all time? Here's what I'll say about that. It's a bittersweet thing because yeah. the photograph uh, speaks for itself. And the, the photograph is not about me. It's about people's connection to seeing it and what it, you know, the emotions that it makes them feel. And I, and I, I have great respect for that. And it's wonderful that something that I created would touch people in that way. Right. But, you know, I, I, I went on to continue to do my job as a photojournalist and uh, for years, every day, somebody would recognize me or make a connection between me and that photograph and want to talk about what had happened to them that day and, and the tragedies that unfolded as a result of it. And um, it has uh, never ceased to amaze me at how profound, you know, the, the events of 9-11 are particularly on people in this part of the country. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it really does. I mean, you know, from many people on Staten Island, this uh, uh, to recognize the Staten Island Historical Society was uh, uh, from uh, uh, from their website here. Um, you know, people memorialized it on their, on their arms, on their backs, uh, everywhere um, to remember that day and never, ever, as we always say, forget that day. I thank God every day that David lived through that. Uh, we know Hanshu, uh, he's uh, one of the great guys. And, uh, you know, that Todd, the photos that Todd took that day, Todd Maisel took yeah. them David. Mm -hmm. You know, that must have been one of the most difficult, if most difficult things in a photographer's life, to photograph a colleague lying on the ground and continue to shoot because we have to document what we do but that must have been arduous on on Todd Maisel, you know? Well, Todd is a great news photographer and yeah. a dogged, determined, dedicated photojournalist, as is David. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the photographs that Todd made of David being, you know, after he was injured are right. just very, very powerful. Oh, I know. And, you know, and then not, we're not even going to get talk about, I mean, we could, but we could take hours of that, the you, you, months and months of, more photos and editing and everything. Oh man, I tell you, it was hard sleeping every night going home editing those photos every single night for months on end. Yeah, but, you know, that video also featured a lot of Aris Economopoulos' photographs, who was with the Star Ledger. Yes. Uh, his pictures are epic. And, um, you know, he had a very rough experience in that day as well. Yes, no, the, the stories are endless. They're, you know, so my question to you, is I this is my question is there were several photos and angles as we know of various first responders raising the flags of ground zero uh and what do you think made your photo take on a life of its own as you're quoted as saying uh in 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 that it did but what my that's my question to you and the reason i say that is i'm a collector of everything 9 11 because of what we lived through and i mean there's photos ranging from the pba magazine of esu guys i have you know i collect all this stuff because it's history for us and life, your photo on life. Uh, then there's, of course, um, uh, Lori Grinker's, right? Uh, correct? Yeah. And on and on and on. Um, the US News and World Report one. So, what answer that, Tom? I mean, talk to us about that, please. So, that's a great question. So, uh, as far as I know, that uh, myself, Ricky Flores and Lori Grinker, the, the three photographers who made a photograph, a still photograph of the firemen raising their flag. Mm -hmm. Lori's and Ricky's are very powerful photographs. There's a horizontal and they're taken from a higher angle looking down on the three firemen and their pictures show the scene and the setting very well. And it's very um, illustrative of, of what was going on there. Mm -hmm. My photograph was taken from a low angle with a long lens and and very much from a frontal perspective. Right. Uh, I think my photograph uh, caught a lot of attention for, th for three reasons. One, uh, it was uh, shot with a longer lens and compressed all that space and really showed the firemen up close. Mm -hmm. Two, it looked very similar to Joe Rosenthal's Iwo Jima photograph. And of course, I get asked that question all the time. Yeah. I was very familiar with Joe's photograph. I got to meet Joe after you know my, i had made my picture and well, he was a wonderful man uh but he did not want to talk about that photograph but nonetheless my picture looked a lot like his and i think third the reason why all three of our photographs uh 
became very well well known is that these images showed something different on what had happened from 9-11, right? The, the other iconic images, most of which are in my documentary, you know, like Richard Drew's, you know, the, the falling man photograph, those were really hard photographs to look at and they were about the destruction and what had happened. Whereas our photographs were about this uh, other emotion, this feeling that people would get from these three firemen who were essentially the soldiers in this, in this battle. Right. Uh, they're doing something that symbolizes something different. And a lot of people tell me that they see patriotism and resilience and strength and uh, more of a positive message from looking at this picture. And I think those are driving factors. The other thing that I think has driven the, 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 my the popularity of my photograph was that the photo editor of my newspaper, Rich Geely, he shared the photograph on the AP wire uh, in the early hours of September 12th. Mm -hmm. And so my photograph got to publications uh, mm -hmm. on the West Coast and around the world before their deadlines, and it was widely published. Right. And right. the next morning, when I, when I reported for work the next morning, right. after just a couple of hours of sleep, was the, the phones were ringing off the hook. And uh, thus began an odyssey of media attention that I would argue that that has not been, you know, that ha that was unprecedented. I mean, hundreds of phone calls. Uh, we had the record had to hire people to answer the phone calls in the wow. mail. And for me, it was a very strange time for for the obvious reasons, but also the fact that I was sub suddenly, you know, put into this spotlight of ha of being a spokesperson for the picture and for photographs on 9/11. I went on the Today Show a number of times and other every major news program. Uh, and we had to hire publicists just to handle all the, re the requests. And I just mentioned that to illustrate just the, sure, the sure. fascination that people had with this picture. And it still happens. I mean, I, I got a phone call yesterday from a man in Florida just wanting to ask and talk about the picture. Well, so it, it just it ceases to amaze me at how 9-11 uh, has re it res continues to resonate with people. Right. Well, I'm right, sure. Well, I'm sure. I'm trying to figure out why we're getting an echo here. Um, that's bizarre. I don't hear it. Okay, okay. I do. I do. Anyway, if you don't hear it, you're good. Um, but you know, the thing that's really, you know, this time of the year, like you said, conjures up so much with so many people. I'm sure you're you get emails and phone calls every year around this time of the year. So it, it's something that we'll always live with, you know, but. Um, thank God for the photographers that documented it. Thank God for the writers that did the incredible stories of reporting it. And uh, thank God for all the first responders and everybody that did their job that day and more, uh, more than their job, they sacrificed it all. So uh, on that note, um, we have a lot more to cover, but one of the things I wanna do at this point is reintroduce everybody. My name is Stefan Kaplan. I'm a social media and visual strategist. Welcome to the Spin It Social Hour. My guest, I am honored to say today, is Tom Franklin, Thomas E. Franklin, uh, who's a professor at Montclair State University and a longtime photojournalist and uh, a resident here in Ramsey, where I live. And it's wonderful to have him on. But also, please share this broadcast and let everybody know about Tom and the other work we're going to show and that we're going to talk about, because Tom has done a lot and we want his name and, and his uh, body of work to get out there. So while we're at it, um, let's go to, um, I'm going to go here. Uh, actually, let's take some questions. If we have any questions, Jonathan, uh, we can uh, bring a couple of questions or comments up. Neil Parek asks, who works with Sri Srinivasan and us at DigiMentors, do you always have two cameras, presumably with different lenses? Good thing you had a backup, he asks. Yeah, so uh, most photojournalists carry two two cameras, and uh, usually a wide-angle zoom is on one, and a telephoto zoom is on the other. Um, and uh, Neil also asked, I see in the in the questions there, you know, what um, what were the camera settings for that picture? And that was those were the questions that my uh, my phone call from Florida yesterday oh, wow. wanted to ask. That's funny. So I know the answers right off the top of my head because I just for answered. It. Uh, it was taken with an early model digital camera called, called a Canon D2000. Uh, in uh, I, I, my, I was one of the I was one of the early digital camera users uh, when you know the news industry started to go towards digital. And this camera weighed quite a lot and was kind of clunky. And 
they use these big fat uh, data cards that almost look like almost the size of my phone to record images. Right. And I had a I had a big one, two hundred and fifty seven megabyte, fifty six megabytes, which today wouldn't hold one single picture. Hold a single photo these days. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it they were awful, and they would frequently corrupt. Uh, and then the picture it's was taken more these days. <laughs> yeah. And the picture was taken at 5.01 p.m. on the 11th. It was taken from roughly the, I was standing at the corner of Liberty and just west of West Street. Um, although the streets were not recognizable at that time. And it was made with a, a 70 to 200 zoom lens with a 1X converter. Uh, and I was standing about 30 yards away. Yeah, no, um, Vincent, Vincent LaFerre is watching. Welcome Vincent, uh, a previous guest. Time. And my ex-colleague uh, and always friend, Vincent. Whoa, go back. Uh, let's have that other one from Vincent. Would love to hear about this image's path to becoming a U.S. stamp. We were going to get to that, actually, Vincent. And what's mm -hmm. the other one from Vincent there? I see. Thomas, haven't really called him Tom. Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> uh, Vince is a very talented photographer. And um, I, I draw inspiration from photographers like him all the time. Absolutely. Uh, we um, had, I had him on uh, earlier and what a what a body of work, an incredible technical photographer. Um, but Tom, to answer, I ask his question, I answer his question. Uh, the path about the uh, the path to the stamp. How did that uh, come about? So uh, after uh, after 9-11, obviously, uh, the postage U.S. Postal Service had contacted me, asking me about using the photograph uh, for the image. And the image was actually owned by the newspaper. So uh, the Postal Service uh, picked a number of images, illustrations, and presented them to President Bush. Mm -hmm. And President Bush selected my photograph. Yeah. And then um, the three firemen and myself were invited to the White House for a press conference unveiling. So. It was uh, really a great honor to be a guest in the Oval Office, and um, uh, that was one of just a handful of times that I was, in, you know, that I've met the three firemen. Um, sure, sure. And the president was really awesome. I mean, he invited us to stay and hang out in the Oval Office afterwards. And um, quick little funny story is that uh, while we were there after the press conference ended, the the president. Uh, asked us to hang out, and, and we did. And he was like giving us a little tour of the Oval Office, and there was a lot of interesting historical things about that. And at one point, the three firemen uh, had, uh, you know, we were there with our spouses too, and uh, the three firemen pulled out copies of the photo, and they asked the president to sign it. And so the president turns to me and he goes, "What about you? You're the photographer. Where are your pictures?" And I said, uh, well, they wouldn't let me bring my camera in, cause, so I figured they wouldn't let me bring my photos in. Anyway, right. the right. president was really pretty cool about it. He pulled out a, a piece of official White House stationery, and he signed something to my <laughs> son, Sean. And it was uh, really one of the really cool memories. And the stamp yeah. is – oh, and very important to answer Vince's question. Yes. So once the stamp was selected, it was a semi-postal stamp, which means that proceeds from the stamp went to help victims of 9-11, raised over $10 million – uh, right, and much right. of that money did go to help people who were affected by 9-11, but a lot of the money was then transferred over to help victims of uh, Katrina. Okay. And so FEMA had reallocated some of that money as well, over $10 million. Okay. okay. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to bring Jonathan on for a second to let everybody see who's been driving or the car behind the scenes here. And uh, Jonathan, welcome. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Jonathan is my co-producer and has uh, tremendous help fielding all the questions um, with the setup of the show, uh, comments, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Jonathan, tell us something about yourself real quick. I am a full-time flaneur, a sometime writer, and part-time tech. You are, and a big, big help, and I appreciate it. I love having you as my co-producer. So, Jonathan, um, you know, do you have a question for Tom? Uh, I have a change of pace question. Okay. I've covered you know, natural disasters or terrorist attacks, such as 9-11. You've covered the refugee crisis, which is oh, decades long at this point. Uh, <clears throat> you have an exhibition about heroin addiction. You've also covered uh, pollution in northern New Jersey. What do you photograph that is for relief, for, for humor, or for upbeat uh, notes? Uh, that's a great question, Jonathan. Um, I like to photograph uh, 
things every day that uh, that inspire me or catch my eye. I mean, uh, I carry a camera with me at all times. If not, I'll use my phone. Uh, sometimes I'm uh, attracted to things because of the light. Sometimes it's because of the subject matter. Um, I am interested in making images of everything in many things in everyday life. Um, I do really like working on projects that are going to have some sort of social impact. Um, you mentioned the heroin addiction project that I'd worked on, which was mostly a video project for me. Um, and it was a really gritty street level uh, type of reporting that was enormously challenging. Um, but that is one of my favorite projects that I've ever worked on. Why? Because I was able to really, really immerse myself in the subject matter. I, you know, I essentially was, was you know, walking on the streets where, uh, you know, where there was, you know, and, and essentially an open air drug market every day. And that required almost like a different type of mindset than I had normally taken. And so, you know, when you can get immersed in something that you're passionate about, then that, that gets to the point where, you know, good work and great work happens. Yes, actually, um, we're going to quickly um, show that uh, just a few frames from that, because I think it's important since you just spoke about it. Here are some of the um, some of the frames from that uh, work that you did. I didn't queue up the video, but I had uh, worked up some frames from this uh, from this project you worked on, this documentary on on heroin and uh, the horrible, horrible nature of it and effects that and the, what it does to people's lives. Tom, you so, want to elaborate? Yeah. So the project wasn't, you know, hey, heroin's really bad. The project right. was about. Um, kind of this nuanced aspect of what was going on in North Jersey. The, 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 the fourth ward in Patterson at that time was, uh, was uh, an area where there were lots of vacant properties. And when there are lots of vacant properties, uh, drugs happen because the dealers have a place to stash, the users have a place to buy, and everybody has a place to hide from the police. And there's also a place for, you know, for, for people to use. And so the project focused on a couple of different aspects. One, there were all these vacant properties there and that that essentially supported the drug trade Two, the there were a a, a a a new crop of drug users from the suburbs mostly white kids in the fourth ward which is a predominantly black neighborhood and so there and what happens when you become hooked on heroin is you eventually become homeless and if you're homeless where do you go to live you go to abandoned properties so patterson's fourth ward had this strange dichotomy of uh, white suburban kids uh, coming and not just kids; these two are, are, are adults coming from the suburbs to the fourth ward to buy drugs. And then at that time, Patterson, you could buy heroin for three dollars a bag. And so I had uh, I had um, I had followed a number of users over the course of many months and told the story from a couple of different perspectives: from the user perspective, also from the police's perspective, as well as the 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 landowners, the property owners, the real estate developers like that one, Charles Florio who was buying up large property sections of properties in the fourth ward as a, as a means of trying to clean up the neighborhood, but also to turn a profit. And he would describe about how you know, no sooner would he start to renovate a piece of, of, of real estate, uh, people would break in, rip the copper out of the wall, steal the wires, and, um, and how it was this kind of vicious cycle of, right. of you know, properties you know, being you know, ripped, ripped and torn down. It was a very fascinating project, and um, I would encourage everybody to take a look at it. I worked on it for the record. Multimedia site is no longer up, but you can see the videos. I did a series of, uh, of a dozen videos, small, small vignettes, five to six minute pieces that told different aspects of the story. One day I followed a, a, a heroin user panhandling in Patterson and he, he demonstrated essentially how he raises money. And then he was mic'd up during a drug transaction. Um, and a lot of it is really street gritty stuff. And uh, it's a product that I'm really proud of. All right. Well, Jonathan, thank you for your question. And uh, we will see you. Okay. A tip of the hat to you, Jonathan. <laughs> So that was uh, one question. Uh, we have a couple of other uh, viewers that have a couple of questions. Let's bring one on, and then we're going to get back to some more about your body of work here. Let's let's bring on um, right here. Let's bring on Seshu. Hi, how are you? Hi guys, how are you? Hi Seshu, uh, you doing well today? Thank you very much. Yes, thanks for doing this, Stefan and oh, no uh, Mr. Frank Mr. Franklin. Thank you so much. I've I've been a 
uh, an admirer of your work for uh, many, many years. I, uh, as a student at Ohio University and also at Indiana University, we've always looked at work of working for journalists, and this is uh, exciting for me to be able to talk to you. So thank you so much for for taking my question. Um, I think you'll I think you'll agree that photojournalism is a uh, difficult and sometimes dangerous job um, for for a lot of uh, a lot of working photojournalists around the world. Uh, knowing what you know uh, of what this position or this job ha entails, would you go back and do it all over again? Oh wow! Hey, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, if you're asking me, would I go back and do it all over again? Absolutely. I I, uh, the, I have never for a day in my life doubted that this was what I was meant to do. I feel very passionate. It began with photography and then it morphed into more of a multimedia type of storytelling and video storytelling. Uh, I love what I do. I feel passionate about what I do. And I would encourage anybody who is passionate about photography or really whatever their passion is to pursue it, right? I, uh, I now teach and I just this week, I usually begin with uh, talking about uh, one of the people that gives me inspiration, Malcolm Gladwell. And Malcolm Gladwell, who you know, you know, wrote a book, Outliers, which essentially put forth the theory that you need to put in 10,000 hours of anything to be good at anything, something. And so uh, I think that once you get start working on your 10,000 hours, your passion develops, skill starts to, to really form. And it's akin to a snowball rolling down a hill. And, you know, snowball will start out small, but once it starts rolling down the hill, it picks up new new knowledge, new information, information, right. new skills, new new ideas, new approaches. And uh, whatever, once you figure out what it is you want to do, get your snowball rolling down a hill. I think Chris, you had a, you had a second part to your question. Yeah, and a follow-up question. And, you know, is that for those who are thinking or considering photojournalism as a career, uh, the next generation of young photojournalists, perhaps, uh, how should they better be prepared to embrace what's in front of them? I mean, we're talking not just, obviously, the content uh, aspect of it, but also the, the business side of things. Uh, I think a lot of uh, photographers, and me included, uh, we, we were passionate for sure about the photography and clearly interested in making photographs that mean something and mean something for our community that we live in. But ultimately, we got to pay bills. And, you know, that's one of the hardest things about being a photojournalist, I think, now is that you know, the papers are dying and a closing shop. Uh, magazines don't pay really almost anything for photographs. I've had a, a friend of mine online tell me that, uh, you know, some of the some of the well-known newspapers that have published her, her, her photographs from all the protests that she's been to, she's only made like five bucks, okay? I mean, you can't live like that. So what do we, where, where, where are we at in terms of educating the next generation to think a little bit about, okay, this is, the passion is there. We got to pursue stories that mean something, but there's also got to be the business side of things where we got to make money somehow. Right. Right. Okay. So that's a that's a great you know multifaceted question. So yeah. sorry for sorry uh, for the long winded no, question. No, but this is a great topic to talk about. So clearly the old model, the mo the model that Stefan and I you know cut our teeth on, that model is the is has changed, and some would argue it's never coming back. Right. right. So. So we now have access to all these great tools and platforms, right? We can record stories and photographs and pictures in so many different ways. I, I really believe it's up to the next generation now to figure out a way to, 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 to make the economy, the, the economic aspect of this really work. Uh, I really do believe that that's where the answer lies. I also think that, you know, storytellers like us, like the three of us, we've got to reinvent ourselves to a certain degree. We've got to figure out different ways, 100%. And, you know, make this work economically. I'll just give you an example. Right. So so I teach, but I also do, you know, a lot of uh, freelance work. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, like, just like you said, there's not money to be made in freelance, you know, documentary work. No. But if but, well, one of the things that I do is I look for grants. Uh, if I, I wanted to, so I'll give you an example. So last, uh, uh, last, sep last spring on my spring break from college, I wanted to go to the border in, uh, in Tijuana and San Diego. So, uh, I sought out some grant money. I got some grant money. It wasn't a lot of money, but it covered my airfare. I, uh, I had lined up a, with a nonprofit 
to do a documentary video on an immigration lawyer there that was uh, receiving grant money or fellowship money from them. So I knew I was going to produce a short piece from them. And then while I was there, I did a freelance story that was published in the LA Times and I had video that was published as well. Now, I, I, I realize that a lot of that is circumstantial and it's up to chance, but I ended up making money on that trip. Not a lot, but I made enough money to pursue my passion, which is to do that type of storytelling. My main gig right now is teaching. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a really good example of how you can diversify what it is that you want to do and still do the kind of work that you want to do. Now, I will say that yeah, that's not, those are not easy and I have lots of connections and experience to try and make those things happen. But um, that's the type of thinking I think it requires today. And uh, reinventing yourself, being adaptable, yep. being versatile, being able to produce, edit, shoot video as a one man band is a big yep. part of it as well. Yep. And you gotta hustle. I mean, it's just, it's so about hustle and it is not easy. It's harder than ever to do this kind of work, but the demand for storytelling is greater than ever. So I do believe really that if, if we recognize that the demand for storytelling is as great as it's ever been, right. yes, that right. the, the model needs to be built to support that. Wow. What, and whether what, it's what, the what? Netflixes of the world or the, the television, the, the, all the programming that's going on, there has to be a way to, to make the, the economics of this work. What an, what an, what an, what an um, uh, you know, incredible, incredible uh, uh, question, question, answer and everything. So, Seshu, thank you very much. We've been showing your website at the bottom before. Uh, everybody, Seshu is a thank wonderful you. photographer, and people should check him out at his website, uh, which is uh, seshuphotography.com. That's S-E-A-S-H-U, photography.com. Seshu, take care of yourself, and thank you for coming thanks on. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Tom, what I want to do now before we get to the next question from Charles Chesler soon is I wanted to go through some of the work here on your incredible project, which is now being shown at the Patterson Museum. It's live online. You've worked incredibly hard on this project for like, what, five or six years at least? Six years. Yeah. And I want to get to it now because we want to dig into it and we want to show this body of work. And I, I'm going to let you talk about it as I go through it. And why don't you tell everybody about Seeking Refuge and this body of work uh, that we're going to see? So in 2015, I was asked to write an opinion piece for Vice. Uh, you may recall there was a, a photograph of a young Syrian child who had drowned while trying to seek asylum in the EU with his family. And this amazing series of photographs of this young, young, young child uh, was circulating around the world. And it really caught you know, the world's attention. And so Vice asked me to write an opinion piece about how, you know, iconic photographs like this uh, could, you know, it can, the question was, can they, you know, um, persuade public opinion or, or change people's perspective or draw attention? And that got me thinking about the Syrian refugee crisis. And so I started doing local reporting here in New Jersey about where, you know, Syrian refugees were being settled in New Jersey. And we have a large Syrian uh, community here. So I did a cross-platform piece for NJ Spotlight, you know, focusing on a group of, um, of, a group of uh, Syrians who were being resettled here. And through that reporting, uh, I found a, a Jewish group uh, that had adopted these Muslim families and the, this unique you know, relationship had formed. And so from there, I then uh, went to Greece, to Athens, and to Lesbos, Greece, which was, Eth Lesbos was like the ground zero of the Syrian crisis. Um, and I did a series of reports there focusing on families who were living or getting out of some of the refugee camps while their asylum cases were heard. Uh, I focused um, on one family in particular that was receiving money from a nonprofit called Human Wire. And Human Wire would connect donors here in the States with actual families like this family right here, the Al Ramun family, mm -hmm. and they would help them move out of a refugee camp and get settled in a, a legitimate apartment in Athens. Um, and so I was doing that kind of reporting. One interesting story that I worked on that came as a result of this family is that I had through uh, through my reporting discovered that the CEO of this organization, Human Wire, uh, was allegedly stealing money from the organization. And so I partnered with the Denver Post. I shared this information right. and this reporting that I had, and we did an expose on him. And 
Uh, eventually, you know, he um, charged with 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 a crime for taking money from this organization. Um, and so that's the type of reporting that I've done. And then, uh, as I was really diving into the to the to the crisis going on over there, I started to focus on the migrants from Central America. And you know, after the election of President Trump, this became a very um, hot button topic. And hey, Tom, uh, it, on that on that note, before mm -hmm. we go too deep into that, I want to because you were talking about your work in Greece. Mm -hmm. Why don't we pause there for one second? I don't mean to interrupt you, but I yeah, want to follow the sequence here. Let me let me show a clip from from this so that people can uh, see a bit of this. Hold on one second. I'm going to stop the screen here. We are going to kind of mute myself. I think what you're queuing up is the the film "The World Arrived at Our Doorstep." Well, the the world, yeah, the world arrived at our doorstep is a a, a documentary video I did on a British couple that was living in Lesbos and uh, were helping refugees arrive, and at the same time they were being vilified by the locals in Lesbos for helping them, for quote unquote encouraging them. They literally helped hundreds of thousands of refugees, you know, arrive safely on the shores there and make their way for processing for asylum. And then when our daughter was born, we decided we would come and try and make a life to bring our daughter up here. I think in the, you know, these days it's really difficult to, to have time to be a family. So like in the UK, you're both working, your kids are with strangers from when they're tiny. And we wanted to actually be parents. We wanted to spend time with our daughter while she was growing up because those years are so fast and so precious. That, and, and this seemed the ideal place. And then things changed a little bit in 2015. <laughs> Well, the world arrived on our doorstep after years of an insulated life. This started for us, you know, we're taking our, our daughter to school at sort of 6.30 in the morning because she had a, a big commute to school. And we're driving to the end of that road and there's women and kids on the beach. And suddenly we've got Syrians and Iraqis, Afghans, all fleeing war, all with their own story, all different religions. Um, and you cannot, as a human, drive past people in need like that. You just can't do it. So we stopped and we started to help. And we haven't got much. So we were giving them our clothes, my daughter's clothes, whatever, food that we could get together. Um, and it started from what was a few boats a week to a few boats a day to 10 boats a day. And in October, at the maximum we had was 200 and we, we actually watched people drown with no way of helping because there's no rescue boats here. There's one Coast Guard boat in Molivos with one crew that was then by sort of May was working 12 hours shifts just picking up people and they couldn't cope and nobody came. So I just wanted to show that. So now, you know, now you can continue if you may, if it's okay with the with the the um, part of now dealing with refugees from Latin America and everything else and the migrants from Latin America. So go ahead, I'm going to put that back up. Yeah. So just to to to, to close the loop on that documentary. So I well, had gone to Lesbos uh, well, by myself to do reporting, but I was also joined by a couple other faculty members and students from Montclair State, and they did their own video reporting. Uh, this is a, a, something that some of my faculty members, uh, David Sanders and Steve McCarthy, and I have done where we take students to, you know, crisis areas like this to do reporting. And uh, it's a way in which I intertwine my teaching with my professional work. And so students help me produce the documentary. And we, at the same time, we mentored them uh, as they produce their own pieces. That's um, and then, yeah, it's really um, it's a great opportunity as a professor, as a teacher to teach like that because it's all immersive. You know, we're there, we're you know, we're we're twenty four seven together, and um, the students get to really experience you know the, what we do as photojournalists. 
Right. Um, so the, 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 the connection, so in 2018, I started to make the connection between the plight of migrants trying to get to the U.S., right. you know, seeking better life for themselves and uh, the refugees from, from places like Syria and the Middle East trying to get to the EU. And there was a lot of commonality with it. And so in 2017, I had an opportunity to teach in Guadalajara, Mexico, which is in the central part of the country. And while I was there, I did reporting where that's where this picture was made of migrants who would ride on the trains. And there are me there are other photojournalists who have done this type of work. Don Bartletti in particular won a Pulitzer Prize for his documentation of, of migrants riding the trains. But uh, I saw this as an opportunity to teach and also do some reporting from that location. And right. one of the people in that photograph, um, he was uh, trying to uh, get from Honduras uh, back to, to Miami, Miami, where he had family. He had a, he had a family there. Uh, he had gone back to Honduras to, to take care of his ailing father and now was trying to cross back illegally to the United States to rejoin his family. Mm -hmm. And so this was uh, you know, a big theme in the story. And I, I've actually stayed in touch with him. He has not successfully made it back to the US. He uh, did uh, sneak across uh, about a year ago, but was captured and sent back to Honduras. Wow. And he's determined to come back. And you know, we can sit here and argue and discuss you know, the politics of this, but at the very core, here is a guy who has lived most of his life in the United States, right. uh, has no criminal record, right. and he has here, and he has a job here. Right. And so, you know, this is, you know, this is a very real situation that it goes on that plays out every day, you know, on both sides of the border in this country. Well, that, that's the core of it. They're human beings who are looking for a better life. And we can sit here, like you said, and many people could, could debate us left and right on pros and cons and everything else. But many of these people, many migrants, many immigrants have been demonized in many ways for simply seeking a new way of life. You know, yeah. I mean, at the core, you know, this 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 man was trying to to, to resume a better life for himself, and uh, he, you know, has no life in Honduras. He said that, you know, that he has pressure there to to be a participant in the drug trade. He right. said that's a really really the only way in which you can make money there, and he didn't want that kind of life. You know, he wanted. Well, that's, a, that's an incredible photograph, by the way. Um, it really, you know. It's you're an amazing photographer, Tom, and we're blessed to have you doing what you do uh, to document this type of work. While while we're doing this, um, we've got about 15 minutes left, and we're going to go through some other work. But let me quickly bring on another uh, person who's been wanting to ask you a question. This is Charles Chesler from New York City, who's also a photographer, and uh, Charles has a question for you. Hello, Charles. Hi, Stefan. How are you? Good. I'm so sorry to make you wait, but we had to get through a bunch of stuff. No worries. This is amazing. Thomas, really wonderful to meet you. Thanks, Charles. I'm sitting here being overcome with emotion. It's the effect that the work has. And so my questions, I, I'm not a photojournalist, but very emotional about stuff. I had a nice question all set up about dealing with your emotions while your camera is focused on such heartbreaking and sometimes horrific things. But you touched on that very early in the, in the interview, but I, I wanted to ask perhaps another question, which is about gaining trust uh, with the refugees or when you're dealing with a heroin epidemic and following people, yeah. how that, ha it's gotta be a key element and it has to be, comes from who you are. I love photographing people, so I get that. And I was wondering if you could address that a little bit because the work is just so profound. So that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't really have, uh, a, a concrete answer on that. Uh, I think it has to do with, you know, humanity. And I try to just be transparent with people and let them know who I am, what I'm doing and what my, my goal is. I always try to keep a camera around my neck. I do not want to, you know, to, to confuse people on the fact of, uh, on what my role is. Uh, the campfire photograph here is actually a good photo to talk about. So, the gentleman who's lying down there on the ground there, he was the subject of my reporting. I had met him in a refugee, in, in a uh, migrant shelter in Guadalajara, which is in the central part of Mexico. And over the course of a couple of days of just talking to him and connecting with him on a very human level, 
uh, he, he trusted me, right? And I trusted him, right? M most importantly, I trusted him. And so when he told me he was ready to leave the shelter and him and a group of, of, of people that he had met there were gonna go leave the shelter and go jump on trains, moving trains to make their way to the border, um, I went with him. That's actually his posse there. Uh, posse is not the right word. Uh, his, 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 his group of friends that he had met there and they're walking their way to the border. This is another uh, migrant from from uh, from uh, from Honduras. Uh, and he was showing me how he jumps on the trains, um, and so this type of reporting requires, I think, just being honest with people and straightforward with people. And going back to my heroin project, that, that this came up a lot because you know people would say, you know, how do you gain the trust of drug dealers? Because I had connected with a drug dealer who who I was able to interview and and report on. And I just find that connect, trying to connect with them on an emotional, on a very human level um, can be very effective. And sometimes it takes time, right? With the heroin project, it took some, in one case, there were, uh, Stefan had showed a photograph of a heroin user earlier. Uh, it took that guy like five or six encounters with me before he agreed to take my picture. And everything from cursing to him throwing me. Uh, and then one day he was like, yeah, I'm okay with it. And there was another heroin user who I had done a lot of reporting on, and he right away said, you know what, my life sucks. It's, this is awful to be a user living homeless and, and on the streets of Patterson, living in abandoned buildings is awful. And I want people to learn from this. So he was a guy who had a, this, that kind of awareness and thought, you know, sharing his story with others would 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 teach people or give teach them a lesson. You know, I think that's where he came from. And also at the same time, the newspaper that I was working for, you know, they wanted releases and I couldn't get releases from these the, the people I was reporting on. It, it, it just wouldn't have happened. And so I was able to get them on camera saying things like, I want people to see this and learn from this. Uh, and so from a legal perspective, we had protection because we had them actually on camera saying, you know, why he was talking to us, why he allowed me to to put a mic on him when he went on a drug transaction. Um, and so, you know, it's all part of the game. You know, your question is all part of the game. It's 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 connecting with people. It's being transparent about what, what your intentions are. And it's putting those 10,000 hours in, you know, the, ten, the my, Malcolm Gladwell thing, which is yeah. always in the back of my mind, is that you don't just drop in in, a, in an open air drug market with your camera yeah. and say, hey, guys, I'm here. No, you know, yeah. it's it requires strategy and professionalism and, that's the, and nuance that's and real, real empathy. Yeah. I, yeah. And empathy, of course. And, you know, the, it's it's all of those things combined and the years of experience, too, of knowing how to judge the situations. Because remember, you know, Tom, myself, other people in, in the many years we've been doing this have put ourselves in some very precarious situations and um, very dangerous situations, myself included. But you ha you, there, you develop, uh, I'm not gonna say this, but yeah, I'm gonna say this. You develop that spidey sense. <laughs> it's, it's like that, that sense that you get, your, you, you know, when to pull back, when you can go a little further, when you've gained the trust to a certain degree, because, you know, these can be, you know, dangerous situations. But anyway, uh, Charles, thank you so much for your question. Thank you for this whole series, and thank you, Thomas. No, thank, thank you, you uh, for being a f uh, big uh, supporter of the show, and we'll see you soon. Okay, Charles? Okay. Oh, by the way, everybody, Charles is teaching. We've been showing it below, but Charles is teaching a workshop next week, I believe, a B&H photo. Right, Charles? September 8th. It's a one light uh, flash thing. Outdoors okay, so outdoors. Look, up, look up BNH and Charles Chesler and check him out, folks. A wonderful photographer. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, bye bye. So, Tom, thank you for taking that question. Uh, with the time we have left, about another 12 minutes or so, I would say, before we go too long here, let's go through the rest of this so people understand the rest of the context of what you did here. Yeah, so the picture that we're looking at now is a photograph that I made uh, from Tijuana. Uh, in um, in 2018, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a a migrant who had just arrived in one of the migrant caravans that were you know so much in the news at that time, uh, and he had uh, s squeezed through an opening in the border wall on the beach there that essentially divides you know San Diego County from from Tijuana, 
and uh, someone had handed him his young young daughter, uh, and he made this you know m mad dash down the beach carrying his child, and somehow uh, uh, eluded uh, border patrol. Um, and this was an incredibly dramatic scene that unfolded in front of my camera. I shot video of it and photographs. It was published in the LA Times and the San Diego Tribune. Uh, and I've actually been able to connect with that guy through social media. And he's living in the United States. He made it uh, successfully across. And, um, you know, that was a really pivotal, pivotal scene that I photographed. And it spoke to the fact that you know, it, it, you know, one of the, 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 the topics, the themes I was exploring was, well, you know, this, this idea of a wall um, does not seem really practical right. to me. And I wanted to explore that. And here I was there and just on like my third day and I witnessed somebody successfully sneak through a wall crossing that was on the ocean that had pillars buried in the sand. You can see the wall right there in that photograph. You can go back. Right. Uh, and it had a dead zone on the other side of the wall in the United States side that was patrolled by Border P Patrol. There was right, a right. second wall, which you can see there, right. all with barbed wire. Right. Um, and yet here was the guy who got through this fortified, you know, wall. And, you know, it, it just and here's a, one of the migrants. who. So the next day after I had photographed that and it was in the papers, mm -hmm. others had found this opening in the wall and did the same thing and snuck through and they were all captured. And they were going to be sent back to their to their home countries. Right. Well, um, I, wanted, I wanted to show, wanted to show full, full frame full here. Frame here. Yeah, and so uh, like I said, through social media, I've been able to connect with that that man um, who has a family here, you know. But he knew he was crossing illegally, and just thought that you know the prospects of a better life. Yes. Right. Well, you know, that is incredible. I mean, and that's where the social media part comes into this whole equation. I mean, it's incredible how we can connect with everybody, stay connected with everybody, even subjects that we photograph like this. That's 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 a story in and of itself right there that you were able to connect with this this gentleman after the the horrible uh, journey. I mean, listen, uh, he made it, thank God, but you know, the stress. There's, uh, there's there's so many, this is what I love about what about storytelling, right? There, there were so many aspects of that story that were really interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll just throw one out there real quickly because this is really interesting for journalists is that after he had snuck through and run down the peach and disappeared into the, into the horizon, uh, we met up with one of the migrants who had traveled with him from Honduras. And so he confirmed, you know, that who he was, what his name was, what his story, backstory was, and why he did what he did. And he connected with us. Uh, we exchanged uh, cell phone information with, with, with his friend. Later that night, his cell, he called me and my, my, my translator, Carla, and essentially said he had made it safely to the first town and that if we wanted, we could go interview him if we would drive him to Los Angeles. So right. now we had an ethical dilemma you know, do we go and get this interview and photographs and video mm -hmm. and or do we, you know, maintain our lane, which is the storyteller and not the enabler. Right. And right. so we had this th right. this really complex dynamic had, you know, had unfolded right in front of us. Right. Well, tell us, uh, you know, with the stories, I tell you, we need five hours for this. Uh, the um, you know the body of work and the uh, stories that come out of it, like you said. But tell us about uh, uh, these next two segments, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. But this is Angels at the Border, uh, volunteer groups that offer much needed assistance and how they came into play with some of this. So the the Pat I was supposed to have an exhibit, a physical exhibit at the Patterson right. Museum of this body right. of work. But due to COVID-19, the right. museum has been closed. So they created a virtual exhibit online. Right. You can go to seekingrefugephotos.com. Right. And we also have pattersonmuseum.com mm -hmm. backslash exhibits. Yep. Make sure everybody goes there to check out Thomas's all the whole entire body of work is there and needs to be seen and recognized. So there are seven essays in this project that focus on different aspects related to this theme of forced migration. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the chapters is on the nonprofits at the at the U.S.-Mexico border, like Border Angels. In fact, I have a Border Angels 
thermos right here, and they provide a, a variety of services to migrants. And so there is this really cool thing that was going on, not only at the U.S. border, but we saw this also in Greece, uh, where these uh, real grassroots organizations that are often run by young people, millennials, who are spending their time and their and using their passions to help others. Uh, that was really pretty remarkable, and I had not seen a lot of reporting on it. And so, oh, I dedicated one of the chapters to groups like Border Angels. Here, they're 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 hiking out into the desert to leave bottles, containers of water for migrants who cross illegally to get to the United States, because a lot of them, particularly in the summertime, die of of high dehydration and heat exposure. And so, right. they were not aiding; they were providing; they were not assisting; they were providing humanitarian aid. And right. they oftentimes come under um, under the heat of, of border patrol for, for for what they do. Right. So the full name of the organization is Angels at the Border. Uh, border. Well, the name of my my reporting is Angels at the Border. Right. And their organization, in case anybody wanted to find them. Yeah. Well, just one of the organizations I had done reporting on was Border Angels. They do phenomenal work in the Tijuana, San Diego area. I just wanted to throw it out there again. And then, of course, there's the resettling parts of this project about Syrians building a new life here with unexpected friends. And this was an organization that you mentioned earlier. So why don't you give a, a minute? Yeah, I love that, love that picture. Stop right there for a second. So uh, very early on in this project, I did, re I did reporting here in New Jersey. All, all, all news, all, all stories are local. Right, Stefan? And so I, the right. Syrian refugees are being settled here in New Jersey. Right. And the woman in the center who's standing on the chair was from Syria and she didn't speak English. And she was, her and her family were really struggling to get their footing here in the US. And Kate McCaffrey, who's on the right there, who's a professor at Montclair State, but does a lot of, of volunteer work. She right. connected her synagogue uh, with a lot of the, the Muslim Syrian families and this incredible bond happened as a result of it. This is one of my favorite stories. Yeah. Um, and here, yeah, that's a great picture. So this family had just arrived in the United States and they get hit with a bill for, for travel and airfare for their whole family and they have no means of making income. And right. so Kate and her synagogue had raised money through a GoFundMe to help pay off their debt. Wow, yeah, no, I mean, the this is really important, Seth. So this is a piece, a cross-platform report I did for uh, for Tap Into Newark. Uh, in in Newark, the, in Newark is a sanctuary city, and mm -hmm. one of their residents had been pulled over by police in a very you know uh, simple pull, uh, uh, traffic stop, and they forced him to give his name, and they ran it through the system, and they found that there was a immigration warrant in his name. He had not committed any crimes, but he missed a hearing. Uh, mainly due to the neg negligence of his lawyer, mm -hmm. and he was turned over to ICE, and he was eventually deported. His case is still pending, but this happened in a sanctuary city, and it violated Newark sanctuary city policy. And so, my investigative piece, you know, exposed how the city. Um, th this is not a widespread uh, occurrence, but the city had essentially the police had broken their sanctuary city policy. And one of the things that happened as a result of my reporting is that the Newark police, and to their credit, uh, initiated a video training program for police on how to handle uh, stops like this and how not to violate their sanctuary city policy. Nice right. result of my reporting. Right. And then, of course, well, thank you for that and, and for detailing it all because everybody needs to learn about this. Um, I, I hope everybody goes to your site and the Patterson Museum site and learns deeply about the six to seven bodies of work, photo essays that you've put together on this. It's a monumental feat. And uh, being online now because of COVID, uh, um, uh, it's, it's right at everybody's fingertips. So no excuses. You can get to this site and learn all about it. Uh, this is important for everybody to know about. And then of course, there's the the protests and also the activism surrounding this with um, local politicians, including Cory Booker, uh, Senator Booker, and uh, many others, but you've been documenting that as well. Uh, very great photo here, by the way. Um, really, really powerful. Um, and so tell us a bit more as we come to a close here on, on the last part here of the assimilation part and to the project and uh, however you want to close this out, Tom. Yeah, so one of those seven essays is on assimilation and how, you know, particularly where we are here in New Jersey, where we are such a diverse 
uh, state and our communities are so richly diverse. Uh, that's a photograph of Patterson Mayor Andre Seo, who's a first gen immigrant. Right. And to his right is Mayor Kerala, who's the four term mayor of uh, Prospect Park, which is near right. Patterson. Uh, right. Mayor Kerala himself was a refugee from Syria and does tremendous work trying to help uh, Syrian causes here in the States. And there are success stories all around us. I mean, this is nothing new. This is the American story, right? We are a country right. of predominantly immigrants and these successors right. exist all around us. But in this, in South Patterson, the predominantly Middle Eastern Turkish Arabic community there, uh, if you have not gone and you live in this area, you should go check it out. The food, yep. the culture, oh. the vibe of that neighborhood is tremendous. And so right. I did a lot of reporting there. Uh, Mayor Sayer is an old friend of mine and is doing tremendous work in the city of Patterson. Um, and this is, an, this is one of the chapters from the project. Yeah, no, I, you know, I love the way you capture his warmth and, and his, the connection to the community. And, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. He seems like a really, really great man. And I tell you, being a born and bred New Yorker who became now 10, 11 years in New Jersey, uh, I've been going to Patterson before COVID uh, more, you know, more and more uh, eating with my wife. And um, we've been exploring Patterson. And I have to tell you, I fell in love with Patterson. Um, it is an amazing place. I love the diversity. I love the food and I love the people. And we yeah, started. So, yeah. So Stefan, so I had par also part of this project. Uh, I had done a piece that was published in the LA times about the food and culture and how mayor Saya is the Anthony Bourdain of <laughs> Patterson. And it's so, uh, yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I also, you know, with all my reporting throughout my career, I've always tried to look for positive stories to tell as as well, because, you know, so much of the news is really negative. And there's a people, you know, like my wife who don't like watching or listening or reading to stories that um, of that nature. So uh, I try to stay balanced with my reporting. The Seeking Refugee Project, Seeking Refuge Project is not from a political perspective. Uh, it's told from a from a human perspective, and the humanity is really always what I've tried to to tap into with my reporting. Right. No. Listen, I, it's a, like I said, it's a deep, deep body of work, and um, I can't wait to uh, dig into it even more. I dug into it a lot for this show, but I want to learn even more because you know we've got the election coming up. We're not going to get into that and everything else, but we've got we've got. We've got, um, uh, this is a turning point for America right now and for this country. And this is why I wanted to have you on and uh, explore this body of work because you can't ask for a more timely subject. Uh, we started with 9-11. We're here and now with this. Tom, I have to tell you, it's been an incredible hour and 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I was not going to cut it uh, remotely short today. Your body of work and you deserve better. And I'm just honored to have had you here. And I want everybody to once again know that Tom Franklin uh, can be found on Instagram at Thomas E. Franklin. Tom, uh, Thomas, I hope you don't mind if I've been calling you Tom the whole time. Um, the only one who calls me Thomas is my mother. <laughs> okay, so, so, Tom, I'm going to continue with that. Uh, but uh, it's I can hardly wait till we can hang out more once this pandemic is uh, is hopefully nipped, nipped in the butt and we get a vaccine uh, and we're able to hang out more and get to be better friends uh, because um, I'm, I'm well, this is great, Stefan. And I want to thank everybody who tuned in. I see my yeah. cousin Holly tuned in. I love you, Holly. And so many friends and yeah. Uh, people. Um, I, I really enjoy talking to people. Reach out to me on Facebook, social media. I'd be happy to. Yeah, to Tom's all on. over it, man. So, you know, the thing is that I wanted to show some others, but we're running out of time. Uh, we've shown a lot. Uh, I hope I've done you justice. Thank you very much. And uh, stay around for one second. I'm just going to do a wrap up. And then I just wanted to say goodbye to you personally behind the scenes. Okay. All right. Thanks, Stefan. All right. Okay. Be right back. So I'm going to stop that from sharing. I'm going to remove you from the screen for one second and say, folks, I wanted to thank everybody. There's like 45 comments and uh, other things where uh, Tom and I and uh, we will get to it. We've tried to be as engaging as possible. My new goal with this show is to bring on live viewers. We did that as well. But uh, I wanted to also get to a couple of final promos. Please don't exit yet so you can hear these. But one, 
is um, from tomorrow's Sunday NYT read along with Sri Srinivasan, my dear colleague who I work hand in hand with, with Digi Mentors. And we do a lot of things. And tomorrow is Sri uh, Sunday NYT read along. Join Sri and Liza Donnelly tomorrow, another one of my colleagues who's an incredible cartoonist, visual journalist, writer, and resident cartoonist at The New Yorker and CBS Sunday this morning. Also, we have She's On Call, a great show tomorrow, Sundays at 11, with Dr. Sujana and Dr. Marina talking all things health, COVID, and many other things. Tune in tomorrow on all platforms at large, hashtag She's On Call. And next week, I'm taking a detour here a bit, but I wanted to expand a bit with this and see how it goes. And I'm bringing on another resident of New Jersey here from Montclair, uh, a great painter, Ricky, I call him, but let's do him justice here, Ricardo Jose Mujica. And uh, Ricky is coming on next week, and he's going to talk about his work that has been shown all over the world, an accomplished painter beyond explanation in the short amount of time I have here, a lifelong friend of mine who I used to roller disco with back in the days. I'm not going to let that one get by, but Ricky is an amazing painter. Look at that work behind him. Uh, I can't wait to bring him on. Uh, so join us next week and let's talk visuals and social media. So folks, thank you so much for being here. And um, I wish everyone well, stay safe, mask up, check out Tom's body of work and be well. And thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to uh, tune out here and I'm going to say hello to everybody else behind the scenes. Take care, everybody. Stefan Kaplan, The Spin It Social Hour. Bye-bye.